Glory be to God. Well, we welcome everybody that's joining us by Facebook this morning. Also, I want to welcome the 11 o'clock congregation because I'm going to be preaching at the grand opening of Platteville at 11 o'clock, and you'll be watching this message uh, by video, getting a taste of that. The anointing will be strong. God's got a word for you. For just receive it. Glory be to God, and uh, thank God this church is growing. Now, uh, one more thought. This week, we had so many, had some really cool things happen. Monday, we had the ribbon cutting of our new building up there in Platteville. You can see a picture of that out on the Get Started Center. And then also, we got a phone call about a week ago from the Telegraph Herald wanting to interview Pastor Joy. And so Jim Swenson came out this week for his, his uh, podcast called uh, Give Me That Bold Time Religion. And he came out and did a half-hour interview with her. And there was a a portion of that in the newspaper on Saturday. And you can go to telegraphherald.com slash podcast and listen to that whole half-hour podcast. He got into some really good questions. I thought she handled things wonderfully. You'll be so proud of her. And and did so, and I am. She did great. And, And not only that, I believe that he even got ministered to Uh, as he's uh, individually on his own spiritual journey. So, man, isn't the Lord good? And what he's doing is good. Man, this morning I want to talk to you about uh, about, uh, the good news of the kingdom. I wanted to call it Regency Restored. And uh, we're going to talk about a little bit what it means to be a regent in the kingdom of God. In, in Luke chapter 4, verse 43, I'm going to read it out of the Good News Translation. Jesus was, uh, he'd gone out into a deserted place early in the morning to pray, and the crowd found him. And they tried to get him to stay right there with them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news about the kingdom of God in other towns also, because that is what God sent me to do. The kingdom of God. What is it? What's the good news about it? And why does it matter to to me? Why does it matter to you? Why is it something to be glad about? Well, let's talk about the word kingdom for just a minute. When we think of kingdom, we tend to think like... uh, Matter of fact, last night in the car as we were driving along, Pastor Joy and I just wondered, you know, thank God for her and her her phone and Google, because we go on all kinds of trips on Google riding in the car together, and I just wondered how, how the geographical territory of the United States of America laid over the geographical territory of Europe. I just wondered how they compared, and so we found a map that just showed all that, and That's how we think sometimes of the kingdom of God. We think of a geographical area. But let's not think of the kingdom, the kingdom of God that way. It's the the kingdom of God is the realm of the king's dominion. Or you could say it this way. It is the, the area where the king's rule, where his control, his authority or command, his mastery It's the area where the king's mastery is demonstrated. That's the kingdom of God. You know, I I can't think of this except I think of, you know, I don't know, Princess Bride or some movie that you've seen from years gone by, the feudal kings and the serfs and and the villages, and how a person could almost live as as a serf out in the outlying areas of the kingdom and just begin to think that they were on their own, that they had their life, that they were in charge of their own domain until the king's soldiers rode in. And it's not like it would be even more potent then and more direct even than the U.S. military came in, and that would be awesome. Literally awesome with all the power and might of the U.S. military. But at least we have a democratic republic, and we have rights as citizens. In that day and age, the serfs, they were the property of the king. The people were the property of the king, as well as everything else. And when the king's soldiers came in, the king's rule, his mastery got demonstrated. That's what I want you to think about, about the kingdom of God. It's that realm in which his mastery is being demonstrated. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we read this, In the beginning, 
God. That's always a good place to start. And notice this, that, that in the beginning, God already was. He already was. Nobody had to create him. He's self-sustaining. And in the beginning, the self-existent God created the heavens and the earth. He created light and lights, the stars, the sun, the moon. He created animal life, plant life, created all those things. And then he created humanity in his image and likeness. Now, I want to go a little bit slow this morning. I'm not going to labor on, on things. But at the same time, I realize that what I'm going to say this morning kind of upends some theology of some people who think that God is in charge of everything. And everything happens for a reason, meaning that that reason is somehow... God's orchestration of it. See, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then, and all the things that are, and that all belongs to him, then he created humanity in his image and in his likeness. Genesis 1, 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man, humanity, man, and eventually woman from man, in our image according to our likeness, let them have dominion, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Let me just give you an example of dominion, the dominion of God. I'm going to jump ahead, but while I'm thinking of it, I'm going to share it with you. When we were first married, the first house we bought, we first had a mobile home, but then we bought a house, and in that, that house was over 100 years old. And in the master bedroom, they had put these one-foot square tiles on the ceiling. You don't see those too much anymore. But to do that, you put wood strips every foot on the ceiling, and you nail up these composite ceiling tile. Anybody remember ceiling tile? And on the walls, they had paneling. Anybody remember wood paneling? Now, here's the thing about that 100-year-old house, is that the mice in the house would use the walls and the ceiling of our bedroom for their racetrack. We would hear the mice run up the wall, across the ceiling, and down the wall on the other side. And, you know, banging on the wall only goes so far to shut them up. But then I learned that God gave us dominion over every creepy thing. Every creeping thing. I may believe that mice are creeping things. And when I learned this, and I realize sometimes when you first learn something, you get a little bit radical. And when you're young, like I was at that time, you're a little more radical. Got your whole life ahead of you. You feel immortal. And then you find out that God gave you dominion over every creeping thing. And one night I had enough. While the mice were running, I said, you stop it in the name of Jesus. And, you know, that was the last time we ever had mice run in our bedroom. Because it's true. Because God gave humanity dominion. Rule. Let's, let's read again. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now think about it. God created humanity. Say it with me. God created humanity, say it with me, in his image and his likeness. Now say it with me. That means humanity was to represent God, to look like God, to live with God, to live like God, to live in relationship with God. That's how humanity was created. God shared his dominion, shared his rule 
with humanity. Ooh, glory to God. Psalm 115, 16 says this, The Lord has kept the heavens for himself, but he has given the earth to us humans. I know this is going to stretch our thinking a little bit. Well, God's in charge of everything. Listen, God gave the earth to us. He gave the earth to human beings. Matter of fact, in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 14, it's recorded in that chapter how King David is leading the people of Israel and they are bringing an offering. They're gathering an offering. They're raising funds, in other words, to build the temple of God. And as they're rejoicing over what is taking place, King David says this to God in his prayer of rejoicing in 1 Chronicles 29, 14. This is the literal Hebrew. He says, everything that exists is from you. That's what David said to God. Everything that exists is from you, and we administrate it at your hand. God who is, was, is to come, owns everything, the earth's the Lord's, the fullness thereof, everything. God made it, he owns it, but he gave it into the hands of humanity to, say it, into my hands. hands. To do what? To administrate it. Now, humans were created to be God's regents on earth. That's what I'm talking to you about right now. And the purpose I'm sharing these things with you this morning is to help us understand that you have a place with God and you have authority with God. You have a responsibility and a privilege in the Lord as believers that a lot of us don't understand and we don't walk in. And Dr. Ed Cole said to men, and it's true of women also, that you have been given spiritual authority by God in your life. And if you don't take your spiritual authority and use it as you should, somebody else will take your spiritual authority and use it against you. How many of us in our life have ever felt like, man, I'm out of control. My emotions are out of control. I'm just, my, my choices are out of control. My finances, my, my, business, my family, my, my relationships, my body. Uh, is that a, or we just feel like, some of us feel like, uh, I ought to, I ought to be able, more on top of things. I ought to have more of a say so. Uh, or at least let me say it this way. God did not make you to be a passive subject of the powers in your life. He made you to be his regent now, what in the world is a regent? Our son Adam is, is going to graduate next month, month from Regent University in, in Virginia Beach. What is a regent? A regent, the dictionary says, is a person who governs a kingdom in the minority absence or disability of the sovereign. Minority meaning if, like if you have a child king that's not old enough to do things yet, a, a regent would be one who, who runs the kingdom. In their stead. Secondly, a regent is a person who rules or reigns, a governor. God made Adam, God made humanity to govern this world. He made you a governor, a ruler in life. Thirdly, it's a member of a governing board like Iowa State University or University of Iowa. UW, University of Wisconsin, a board of regents that, that has authority from the state to govern that institution. Listen, regency means acting as the agent of a governor or a monarch to supervise, or to administer. It makes me think of in Matthew chapter 9, if you'll go with me to Matthew chapter 8. Let's look for just a couple minutes. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion, a centurion who was a, not Jewish, a Roman officer, came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. 
but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Catch that. He says, he recognized authority. Jesus said, Jesus marveled. He goes on to say, he marveled when he heard it and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I've not found such great faith, not even in Israel. So Jesus is marveling at this and commanding the man's understanding of faith and a, through his understanding of authority that Jesus doesn't, you don't have to come to my house. You're the king. Speak the word. You just say a word, and it's done. Amen. That's kingdom. That's, that's the realm. What's he saying? He said, Lord, you don't have to come. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth in my house as it is in heaven. Just, just say the word. Just say the word. Now, let's press on. See, God made you, he made you to have dominion. He made humanity to have dominion, but Adam lost it all. We were made, humanity was made to, to, have, to bear the image of God, to be his reflection. When you saw Adam and Eve, you, you saw the animals could say, look at that, that's what God looks like. He was created to, to have rulership or regency under God and is created to live in relationship to have a relationship with God an intimate relationship with God but he he listened, he swallowed another word it wasn't just the fruit he swallowed he swallowed the devil's word and he enslaved humanity to forces that were intent on our destruction and the image of God on the inside of him, the light of glory on the inside of him went out. The life that was on the inside of him went out. And, he, and he, death came into him. Spiritual death. A new character. You could see it that when God came into the Garden of Eden, his friend, Adam's former friend, came into the Garden of Eden. God hadn't changed. Kind of reminds me of the older couple who going down the road in... He's over in his, he's behind the wheel. She's over hugging her door. They're going down the road and some young couple goes the other way on the road. They're in a pickup truck with a bench seat. And, and man, apparently it's a tough pickup to drive because they're both behind the wheel. Anybody remember those days? I mean, they're just sitting there. Yeah, she couldn't get any closer to him and he's loving it, feeling like a king. And the older couple sees them go by and the woman says to her guy with a tear in her eye, I remember when we were like that. And the guy looks back and said, I haven't moved. And God came into the, that was kind of a joke. <laughs> but God came into the garden in the cool of the day to walk with Adam. I said, Adam, where are you? God already knew. He knows everything. He was trying to surface something so Adam could recognize something had changed. Adam said, I hid in the bushes. Because I was naked. And God says, have you eaten the fruit? Have you disobeyed? And Adam, being so noble, says, the woman that you gave me, she gave me of the tree, and I didn't eat. I didn't eat. That's not how it was before. What happened to the life that was in him? The life that was in him before, that was given him the power to reign left just like God had warned him he died and that was your condition and my condition Ephesians 2 says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins it wasn't just that we were behaving wrongly it's that we were wrongly <laughs> we were dark on the inside and slaves to the kingdom of darkness but here's the good news of the kingdom is the good news of the kingdom is that through Jesus Christ God has restored us to those positions and restored to us those things that Adam forfeited from us. That's shouting ground. Through Christ Jesus, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you get life on the inside of you. 
the image of God. You become a new creature in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says. Old things of a dead life pass away and all things become new. Life restored and that life power that comes with it enables you to reign as a king once again. And you're restored into a right relationship with God of intimacy, the damage done, the, the relational breakdown that had happened because of Adam's sinful actions. That breakdown gets wiped out of the way through Christ, and we get restored. You got restored into a place of fellowship with God, close, personal relationship with him. Now listen, let, let's go to Romans chapter 5, and let's unpack this for just a couple minutes, because I don't know about all of you, but I remember when I began to see these things years ago, when I began to be taught these things and shown these things from the scriptures, it was almost too good to be true. Because I was raised in church, but I didn't realize this is what had happened. This is what God did for us in Jesus. This is what God's brought us into as believers. It's the good news of the kingdom that your regency with God has been restored. Romans 5, 17 says this, for if by, if one, if by one man's offense, that one man is Adam. Can you all say one man? See, these two verses are the story of two men and what their actions did to you. Because the good news of the kingdom is that the image of God in us, rulership under God or regency through us, and relationship with God have been restored to us through Jesus Christ. For if by one man's offense, death reigned through that one. Death here is not physical death, it's spiritual death. God told Adam and Eve, the day that you disobey, you'll die. Well, they didn't fall over dead physically. What happened? They changed inside. And spiritual death, and understand this, physical death came with it. It came with it. Spiritual death is like a, an ungodly virus that came into us that runs rampant through our being that eventually takes each of us to the grave. And that's, but that spiritual thing came before the physical thing did. And it reigned through him, through Adam. But notice this, for if by one man's offense, death, spiritual death, reigned through that one Adam, much more, can you say much more? Much more. Say it again. Much more. Oh, I want you to catch that. Say it one more time. Much more. Because sometimes believers say, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, you're saved by grace, but you are not a sinner anymore. Much more. Your character, your nature has changed. You become a child of God. You become a different person on the inside. That's why we behave differently on the outside. Can I get an amen? amen. Much more those who, if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and, the, oh man, abundance of grace, abundance of grace. What's an abundance of grace? What's an overflowing of grace? What's an overwhelming of grace? Well, I double dog dare you to go down here by the river and camp at that Miller Park that's down there by the dog track. I just double dog dare you tonight to go down there and pitch your pup tent down there and start, try to stay dry. Why? Because the Mississippi River has overwhelmed, overflowed. We got an abundance of water. There's actually, there's absolutely changing the, the geography. How many of you could use a change of scenery in your life? Yeah. The abundance of grace. Ephesians 2.8 says that by grace, by God's grace, you're changed. By God's grace, you're saved. And that abundance of grace 
How much more they that receive the abundance of grace, the flood of grace, the overflow of grace, the super quantity of grace, the overwhelming of grace in our life. Woo, hallelujah, God's grace flooded me. God's grace won my heart. How about you? His grace. They that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. And it's a gift. It's a gift. It's not a wage you earn. It's a gift. What is righteousness? Well, I know in our American mind, our Western mind, we think of lawsuits, the state of Iowa versus so-and-so, and we think of righteousness in court terms that someone is, is charged with something, and then the, the, the trial takes place, and they're, they're acquitted, or the judge declares them not guilty, and so... They're righteous. And it is a courtroom term, but I want you to understand, in Bible days, they didn't have the state versus. They had one person versus another. And to be declared righteous was the judge was look at if Lana and Sherry were having a case against one another. Okay, now I am going to get in trouble because I'm about to declare one of them righteous and the other one's probably going to go home with the devil beating on him saying, well, I wonder why pastor declared her righteous and didn't declare me righteous. So let's just pick mythical person at the end of the front row. Sherry's in a civil suit and the judge looks at those two and says to Sherry, you're right. You're right with me. You're right. It's right in life. See, being put in right standing with God, having your sins forgiven, that's just part of it. It's supposed to carry over into the reality of how we live and who we are. That's true righteousness. It's kind of like the Mod Squad years ago when Lincoln Hayes would say, righteous. Lincoln. Some of you guys don't remember that. You're just too young to have missed all the quality stuff. I mean, it's just... No, it's just one white, one black, one blonde, right, guys? <laughs> no, righteous. They still use that term today. It's righteous. It's got nothing to do with. It's got nothing to do with the court. It means it's right. It is right with each other. Matter of fact, it says they that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Now, notice that shall reign in life through one Jesus Christ shall reign in life. And life here is not just our 24-7 existence. Life here is a word for eternal life. Verse 18, Therefore, as by one, through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, that's Jesus Christ's death on the cross, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. That's a lot of words, but let me, let me just quickly unpack that for you. What Jesus Christ did on the cross did not just result in God's gavel sound slamming down saying, okay, you're forgiven. What Jesus Christ did through his acts was put you right with God in a way that resulted in life coming back into you. It's a justification resulting in life. And so you as a believer now have something inside you that you didn't have before you accepted Jesus. You have eternal life on the inside of you that gives you the power to reign as a king. They that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall be a regent under God. Shall reign in life. Are you with me this morning? This is the good news of the kingdom of God. That you don't have to be run over by the circumstances of life. That God, in, Romans, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, it says, through, through what Jesus did, he has made you kings and priests unto God. He's made you a king. Now listen, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4 says, where the word of a king is, there's power. Remember what the centurion said? You don't have to come to my house. Just speak a word. Speak a word. And my servant, and things will move. Things will change. 
Listen, that is the place of kingdom. And that is the place into which God has lifted each one of you that have believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's made you to reign in life. To reign in life. I know some of these things are far-fetched. They sound spectacular because they are spectacular. I grew up in a little town of 700 people. And a lot of people that believe, yeah, but you're now a pastor for 30-some years. That's why things were for you. Listen, when I was still in my 20s and we were still living, before I'd gone into the ministry, we had a, our 100-year-old house on an acre lawn, and most of it was front yard going all the way up to the road, and that's where the water meter was, and Juanita from the city hall, which was actually the barber shop and her office in the back, she called me one day, and she said that they had noticed that at our house, something was wrong, and we were losing thousands of gallons of water on our side of the meter, which meant we were buying it. And I was given it as options as a 20-something, a young 20-something. What are you going to do? I mean, we have to fix it. We have to stop it. And in our community, they would water witch. They would use divining rods, wires that crossed. You know, they used to, it was occultic. And the Bible pro- tells us not to participate in it, in the powers of darkness. But they would come out and they would water witch for, for where the leak was. And I said, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing it. I'm not, I'm not participating in those things of darkness. He said, what would you do, Pastor Warren? I said, I stood there. Maybe I sat there. Most likely I stood. What I remember, what I did was I commanded the water to stop. I commanded the leak to stop. And the same way those mice quit running, that water stopped flowing. Now, I'm a lot older now than I was then. But you know what? I'm getting my radical back. I'm getting my radical back because those things don't change. The devil didn't change. God didn't change. The name of Jesus didn't change. Our power didn't change. Grace didn't change. Life didn't change. Probably the only thing that changed was me, and I'm changing back. Hallelujah. Because we're made to reign in life. Come on, believers. How many know what I'm talking about? To reign. We got something on the inside. Working on the outside as we put it to work. Man, this is the good news of the kingdom. It doesn't stop, doesn't stop with, with me. I mean, years later, I'm ministering my first trip on the road. Uh, I've got a lot, bunch of people lined up to, be, to come up for ministry and and again, I'm just a, I'm just a twenty something out there, you know, green, wet behind the ears in ministry. And I remember people standing up there, and I asked the first person, "What do you want the Lord to do for you?" Because that's what Jesus did. He said, "What do you want me to do for you?" And so they said, "Well, I want to quit smoking." I said, "Well, you can quit smoking. The Lord had delivered me from smoking, so I knew that was possible." I said, "You can quit smoking. The greater one's in you. He's not in your head. He's in you." And when I said he's in you and pointed at their stomach, they went like I punched them, fell out under the power of God. I thought, woo! He said, what'd you do, Pastor Warren? I just went ahead and acted like I knew what I was doing. <laughs> Minister the rest of them. Hallelujah! People getting free. We don't look for devils on doorknobs, but man, when demons show up, we get rid of them. Got a call years ago from someone, and we went over to their house and, and prayed for them. They didn't need the salt on their windowsill anymore. And thank God they got delivered and freed up. And they're still walking with the Lord today. And through their witness, a lot of people have come to Christ and even come to this church. And we're so thankful. So thankful that we've learned that what God gave Adam and he gave away, Jesus bought back and gave it back. Can you say amen? Now listen, Jesus said this. This kingdom's not of this world. It's not political. It's not material. It's not even of our passions. We get so passionate sometimes, even selfishly passionate or just stirred up 
about things we care about. It's, this kingdom of not, God is not about, God's not reigning in that. God's regency through us is not showing up and all that natural stuff. It's spiritual. Matter of fact, in Romans 14, verse 17, we read this. That we ought to be considerate of other people. And not just want to get what we want to eat or drink all the time. Not just, what get, not just focus on what we want and have it our way. Because the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. But the realm where, where God's mastery. Just like those soldiers coming into that village. The realm where God's mastery is showing up in our life. Is, is. Well let me read it to you out of the New Living Translation. For the kingdom of God is living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And, and as, as someone with a basic melancholy temperament, high on the melancholy scale, man, as someone who said happy thoughts are for shallow people, it, it's taken me a little while. And I have to focus on the fact that God's kingdom is not just, it's not a matter of finding the fault with everybody or noticing what's wrong with everything or getting down about this or that or getting intense about this over here. But God is reigning in my life when I'm living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. See, the kingdom is not a matter of this physical world it's in the Holy Ghost I'm going to encourage you to develop that relationship with the Spirit of God and grow in it, hallelujah Jesus said and here's the good news Matthew 6 33, if you seek this kingdom everything that satisfies will be added to you in case you're wondering if God really wants it to, for you, Luke 12, 32, let, let, all, let all question about God's attitude about your walking in it be settled. Luke 12, 32 says, do not fear, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's dad's good pleasure, guys, to lift you into a place where under God, you're his region. And you're calling some shots. And you're walking in the Spirit. Jesus said finally in John chapter 3. He had a guy come to him at night and say, Surely you're from God because nobody could do the miracles you do unless God was with him. And Jesus told the man, Unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. You'll never make sense of it. You just can't understand it. You, you can't find your way into it. It doesn't, you can't walk in it. But thank God that if you're born of the Holy Spirit, if you've called on the name of Jesus, then his kingdom is yours. His kingdom is yours. Let's have every, every, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Father, we sow it into our hearts Father, your word is alive, it's powerful, it's sharp, sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides our thoughts from our hearts. And I thank you and, and clears our affections. Thank you, Father. It builds a vision. Thank you, Father. May it, it, it seek, seep down, Father into all of our hearts. So the Lord, each person in this room and each person in the sound of my voice catches a reality from you of who you've made them to be. They're no longer a slave, they're a son. They're a daughter. They're no longer a subject of all those passions and darkness and the evil forces of this world. But they're more than conquerors through you that loved them. And to you we give all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello and thank you for joining us this week. 
If this ministry has been a blessing to you, I'd like you to prayerfully consider partnering with us financially so we can get the Word of God to more and more people. We really do pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if you're in this area, next Sunday at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, come on out and join us. If you're not here in the area, then please join us again online next Sunday. Thank you again and God bless you.